Welcome to the Holiness Today podcast. On today's episode, listen to a conversation I have with Director of Global Education and Clergy Development for the Church of the Nazarene, Dr. Klaus Arnold. In our conversation, Dr. Arnold shares his journey in ministry and what his hope is for the global church. Dr. Arnold, excited to have you on the Holiness Today podcast. Tell us a little bit about how God called you to salvation, to his church, and really how God called you into ministry. Uh, And you can be as brief or as long as you want. We're excited to hear about you. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for the uh, possibility to share a little bit of uh, my life and journey. Well, as you can hear, I'm from Germany. And so I have a German accent, worked on that for about 60 years. Um, I grew up in a, in a Lutheran home and um, a, a traditional Lutheran Christian home. Uh, I was baptized as a child. My parents took me to church. I went to the children's church. And then also when I was 14, I had my confirmation. That is the time when you are accepted uh, into partaking in the uh, Lord's Supper, and so uh, went through all this, the youth group, and uh, I always had a sense of um, God's love for me, and a sense of, uh, yeah, that's the, that's what I want to participate in as well. However, uh, it was at the time uh, when I was 14, 15, and I began to attend the youth group, we had a youth leader who was part of the pietistic movement within the Protestant Church of Germany. And, and he made an emphasis, or always shared about, uh, you know, that we are Lutherans following the tradition, but it is also important to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, I listened to that, and uh, I think after, yeah, three or four years, I realized that something that, that I don't have. And um, by that time, I must also say that this pietistic um, youth leader of, of the church, he was fired by a new pastor who came in who felt that this youth leader was too conservative, too pietistic, and he didn't, he didn't want him. So he fired him, and then he was looking for, for a new church. And many of the young people, and by the time I was 17, um, were disappointed. And, well, we did not leave the church at the time, but we had independent youth meetings with him, uh, not in the church. And we were about 15, 20 people. But one of our youth members uh, worked at at a bigger company near Frankfurt. And there, he uh, participated in, in a Christian, uh, well, he participated in, in a, a family retreat um, where he realized that one of the attendants also worked in the company that he worked with. And he said, oh, I didn't know you were Christian. And uh, the, well, the company has about 2,000 people there. So you don't have everybody personally, but he's in, in from seeing him. Anyways, he said, so what, what, what church are you part of? And, and he said, well, I'm part of the Church of the Nazarene. And so the, our, uh, heard from our youth group, he said, the Church of the what? And then he said, well, he tried to explain it to him. He said, why don't you come? Um, besides the Sunday morning, we also have Sunday evening services. And you are, you know, you're invited. And so he came and he took along a couple of people and they were so excited. Then they took the whole youth group along and it was just marvelous, I have to say. So out of this youth group, because we came from another city and we were driving about half an hour to get to the Nazarene church, then out of that youth group, a new Nazarene church was started then in the city that I come from. So that's that's my story, how it came to faith and then also to the Church of the Nazarene. 
And then, so at what point, I, if I if I saw this correctly, you you're a graduate of Mid America Nazarene University, is that correct? So you came to the states at some point in that journey, is that right? Well, um, then I I when I was in the youth group in the Nazarene Church, then um, we I I felt a call to the ministry at that time. I had another. I was already enrolled in another program in Germany in business administration, and was about to. Yeah, finished that when I was, I think, 21. And uh, at that time, I felt called to ministry, but I said, uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a pastor. I do not sing or play an instrument because all the pastors I knew then in the Nazareth Church, either they played the piano or the guitar or right. something. And I said, oh, right. uh, that's not me. And we never had anybody in our family being pastor. So I, I was not sure. But we thought about it, prayed about it, and then I felt this is a call to ministry. And I enrolled at European Nazarene Bible College in Switzerland. But the college and its program is affiliated, or was affiliated at the time, to Mid-America. So uh -huh. I actually graduated from Mid-America with other putting a foot on the property or the campus of Mid-America. But uh, after... I graduated from European as a college and the degree was from Mid-America. We came here to Kansas City and I attended seminary from 85 to 88. And that was then that I visited Mid-America for the first time in my life. <laughs> you you visited, visited your alma mater after, That's after right. you graduated. That's good. That's, That's right. good. And then so... What time after that? I, it looks like it, it, 1993 is when you, you became a missionary for the Church of Nazarene and, and went back to Europe at that point? Well, actually, I went back in 88, 88. To, uh, after I graduated from seminary here, and we pastored a church for five years in Germany um, outside of Frankfurt, uh, Germany. And that was, that was a, a wonderful time. And after the five years, I received a call from European Nazarene College uh, to be uh, to be the pastor of college church and to be um, a professor at the at the college, so a part time position on both. And uh, but uh, then I realized, or I was told, in order to be a professor at the university, you have to become a missionary. So I said, all right, because. The uh, the service of European Nazarene College is not to Germany, but has been at that time already, and it's now to all of Europe and even now to the Middle East. So it wow. is a, a missionary a school. So I understood that, and then we, we became missionaries, but served all of our missionary time with European Nazarene College. So what was that like in '88, and then and then moving into teaching when? you know, post-Cold War, the end of the Berlin Wall. Was the Church of the Nazarene in uh, Eastern Germany, but not, not you know, kind of a creative access area? How did that look? And from your experience, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, we came back and within 10 months, the, the Iron uh, uh, Curtain came down and that was a, a very exciting, amazing time. And we did not have any Nazarene presence there. So um, it, it, it was very exciting, I must say. And what was, it was something that we never thought would happen in our lifetime. You know, you say, well, Germany should be unified, but well, maybe sometime in the future, but that it happened so fast and that it happened without bloodshed. I mean, that was the greatest uh, miracle, we have to say. And so uh, our church then, uh, we started to, and I was on the district advisory board at the time to say, how can we reach now into Eastern Germany and Eastern Europe altogether? And we started uh, from Berlin into, from West Berlin. We had uh, two churches already in West Berlin into East Berlin, but also from uh, Germany into some of the Eastern uh, states, Eastern German states. So all of that happened within these two amazing. or three years. Yeah, it was very amazing, exciting time. But also, but then when I came to the college, we realized the college was serving all of Europe, both European as a uh, college. But uh, 
Europe at that time meant Western Europe, right? You know, right. Uh, because you couldn't go into this. And that was then a massive change because when Eastern Europe opened up, it was like two times as much of land mass and country were now open that we never had before. So there was then this reaching out into Eastern Europe and the European Asian College was right in the middle of that. All of that was very exciting. It was messy, <laughs> although not easy, but very exciting. Right? So, yeah. so did, did uh, around that time period, did there was there satellite schools that started being set up? Obviously, this is before... Uh... We could oh. zoom like this and these kind of things, but did they start set up, setting up satellite uh, schools in the former Soviet Union? How did that look and what did that develop? Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. The one thing is the, the language at European National College has always been English, the language of instruction. So everybody who came to the college had to speak English. And for, for you know, however... In Western Europe, English is the first foreign language that every kid learns in school from fifth grade five on to the graduate. So everybody has some basic knowledge of, well, not only basic, but they can you know, communicate. However, to study theology is, is something yeah. else. So uh, at the school, we usually had uh, English as la second language courses for the various entry the levels that people had, but it took a year or so to get everybody, you know, sometimes only uh, to pass. However, with Eastern Europe, English was not a language that was taught because it was the language of the enemy. To yes. Speak. And so that was a little more difficult. However, we said, well, how can we reach and prepare the people for ministry where they are? And that was, well, if they can't come to us, uh, because it was really more difficult than, well, they, they could come, but uh, for them to go through the whole language uh, deal was quite a challenge. So what they did is, why don't we start with classes in the language? So we went, were teaching, were translated, uh, and then we, after a year or so, and we saw, okay, we have some of the students that are very promising, and then we made sure well, we teach them English and we bring them to the college to finish the program also faster. Because, you know, if you travel there, have a couple of courses and leave again, it takes longer to go through, you know, the program. Right. And, um, but so, but we said we want to, to reach out to everybody, help people prepare for the ministry, but those who have the potential, who are younger, and then we bring them to the college. So we had these or to the campus. So we had this double uh, approach. One is we will be there, but then we invite also students to come to the campus. So in that, did you rely pretty heavily on uh, missionaries in those countries to kind of set up uh, local learning sites and things like that? Was that kind of the, the, the initial structure of that or uh, absolutely. native we speakers? Had, absolutely. We had the missionaries played a, a Central Rhone. At that time, it was um, uh, Chuck and Carla Sandberg who were missionaries there. And actually, uh, Carla Sandberg became the theological education coordinator for all the Soviet Union. And, and she was the right person for, for that. And she set up uh, quite a bit of it. But she then worked directly with our school in, you know, what courses to teach, how to set it up. And the teachers that were invited not only came from UNC, actually the biggest number came here from colleges, seminary, and from different colleges in the United States. So they came all in, which helped quite a bit because uh, UNC or the small school couldn't do all of that. But with the help of people, and that shows the beauty of a global church, you know, and what an opportunity and to connect and to be involved. It was a blessing, a win-win for those who went to teach, to be, you know, to teach in the former Soviet Union or, or other uh, Eastern European countries. But also for the countries there to meet people from the West, make connections. We had the work and witness teams to help build up uh, the churches. And we also had a learnings um, facility where they came together. So... It, that was a 
very important time of growing together, coming together, and for everybody to understand we are a global church and mm -hmm. what a blessing that is. Yeah. Flash, uh, fast forward a little bit. God yeah. used all of your experience in decentralized learning and local setups and going into the former Soviet Union to bring you into your role now. Uh, but uh, kind of a weird start for you because you got, was it April 1st, 2020 was when it was effective, but you weren't able to travel here into your actual office until what, 2022? Is, is that how the story went down? That's if I'm exactly, remembering correctly. Yeah, you're right. We <laughs> so were, tell us a little bit about that. That's a kind of a recent history for all of us that experienced the global pandemic. But uh, from your experience, what was that like? Yeah. Well, the election took place in December of 2019, and the start date was then April 1st, 2020. And our, I already was invited to participate at the global, uh, at the uh, general board meeting in February 2020, which was supposed to have happened in Korea. Yes. Uh, so we were getting ready for all of this and then COVID hit. And uh, then we kind of, we already had packed up stuff <laughs> at uh, in our <laughs> home. And, uh, but uh, at that time we said, well, it will be four weeks. It will be two months. It will be three months. We said, well, let's work. At that time, Zoom had already you know, had been invented and had been used heavily also by European National College at the time for our different learning centers. Uh, so it was something that I was used to already, but um, it happens out here greatly as well. And then we realized that uh, I couldn't, we couldn't get um, a uh, interview appointment at the United States Embassy in Germany uh, and without that, we couldn't travel here. At that time, it was still possible to travel a little bit, but things were shutting down quickly. And then there was no travel possible and nothing was possible. And so uh, we had to wait for two years. You're right. Actually, things opened up again in November 21, uh, also at the embassy. However, you know, the list of people who were signed up to have an interview for a visa to the United States was very long. And then we had our interview only in May of 2022. And then in June, we're able to, to move here. So did you feel that that was a, uh, obviously you wanted to get into your role, but was that kind of a nice uh, runway, kind of slow experience into your role, being able to do it distance, or was it aggravating? You think, yeah, what was your experience as you're learning the new role and everything? Well, it, it was both. On, on the one hand, it was aggravating because we were, we packed our things uh, mm -hmm. and then we unpacked them again. And then we said, okay, getting ready, packing and unpacking. And then we unpacked and we said, let's keep it unpacked uh, until we, we know for sure. So that was a bit aggravating. Yeah. However, what was nice is that um, because of Zoom technology and everything changed to it, uh, I had a chance via Zoom to actually meet all of the regional directors, all of the global ministry center people, but also all of our school leaders internationally via Zoom within the first 18 months. You know, this would not have been possible to travel. But uh, so it was a good time to be introduced to the role to get to know the people and the situation and and in that sense it you know also has been a blessing has been setting a good foundation then when i could travel i was not traveling to strange people but to people right. i had you known. already kind of interacted with yes correct yeah. yeah so as a director of global education and clergy development you kind of serve as a bridge so to speak, between the academy and the district and the local church. Tell us, tell our listeners just a little bit about that, just a, just a short synopsis of what that kind of looks like. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned here is, is key. Education from the very beginning in the Church of the Nazarene has played a key role in fulfilling the mission of making Christ-like disciples in the nations. It has been holiness evangelism, uh, 
holiness missionary work and holiness education that have been the pillars upon which the church has been growing. And, um, and I, I must say, I'm very thankful for that tradition in the Church of the Nazarene. And it is true to this very day because the, our schools do not exist for themselves or to be a nice school or to have wonderful programs and the best professors. Well, we want to have all of that. But the final reason is we are part of the mission of God to make Christ-like disciples and nations. And what we find is that in and through our education institutions, we are actually able, and, and that's true especially for the uh, liberal arts universities that we have, we are able to reach people that we are not reaching through local church ministry. Young people, you know, between the ages of 18 and 22 or 23, uh, who, who want to learn, who want to earn a degree, but they come to our universities and they learn about faith, they learn about what we are all about, and many make a decision also for Christ, who who do not have, have maybe a similar experience like I do came from Christian background, but not with a personal commitment, and then hear this for the first time. And we, we have to say, we get more and more uh, people from other denominational backgrounds into our university because they believe in what we are doing and what a wonderful to, to reach out. Let me share, just share one story that I realized that I experienced not, not here in the United States, but actually when I visited uh, the African Nazarene University last year during their graduation ceremony. And there were about, uh, I think, 900 graduates. And when I was sitting there, I was sitting next to the uh, Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, uh, Dr. Rod uh, Reed. And I, I said to them, when I looked down there, I see quite a few of the female students who are wearing a, a hijab, you know, the, 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 the Muslim, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what do you call it, uh, where you're covering your head. Yes. And they had, and they had the, the graduation hat on top of that, but you could see these were Muslim girls. And, and I, I said, you know, uh, that is interesting. Uh, tell me about it. He said, well, Quite a few of our students are children of people who work at the embassies here in Nairobi, Kenya, and they are Muslim. However, they believe in the values of what we do and in our educational quality. And so these students come here. And, and then I said, what a wonderful opportunity. For four years, they are exposed you know, not only to fine education, but also they are part of chapel every year, every week, of small groups, of other events, of uh, uh, working and living with other students and Christians from all over Africa at that time, and what an influence it has on them, and especially the girls who usually do not have access to gospel, you know, in, in the... Uh, Muslim world or many of the countries and what a time to reach them and form them also and where I thought what a great ministry opportunity we have to reach these people that we would not be able to reach in any other way and there were great stories from that and you could see they were singing along in the songs and moving like you know you would expect in African service and I thought what a wonderful picture here and praise the Lord for and again, I, you know, inform me as well, because just to get a picture on it, you are responsible for the facilitation and connection with over 50 institutions worldwide. Is that, is that correct? So how does that look and what is your role? Uh, how do you interact with those schools? Yes, we have, we have 50 schools uh, with, but they have, most of them have campuses, but all of them, or most of them, I must say, have also learning centers uh, all over. So we have 50 schools that have with a total of over 1,000 learning centers. Wow. 
in over 120 countries that we are reaching and uh, serving a total of over 43,000 students. And that is, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, our role is one of facilitating. It's not one of uh, where we tell them what they, what they are doing. Each one is an education institution and they have various procedures and policies, uh, how they run the school. However, what we want to make sure is two things. On the one hand, that they stay on the on mission with the Church of the Nazarene. So what we do is, uh, uh, in var at various times, we come in and do quality missional reviews, where we meet with them and uh, church leadership, like the regional directors or district superintendents, and different people come in, and we 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 have a meeting there at the school for three, four days, and we come in with people from different international backgrounds from around the world to ask questions. How are you doing this? How are you, what's your connection to the Church of the Nazarene and to the districts, local churches that you have? Because we want them to stay and we need to stay together. We cannot, uh, right. you know, work in silos. Uh, and sometimes that happens. That's too bad. And we all, it's, it's something that we need to work on, that we need to foster important relationships, partnerships. So that's one thing we do, these quality mission rules. The other thing that we do is that we invite or, or uh, provide opportunities for us to meet and to learn with each other and from each other. Now, in this time and age of internet uh, uh, options and possibility of having borderless education, it doesn't matter anymore in which country you are. You can enroll in a program right. anywhere in the well that also gives us some opportunities where we say okay we have people who want to learn and don't have access where they live but through internet they have um, one example would be uh, the ministry of european national college now with the arabic world they have an, an arabic learning center where everything is online but through that program can reach into countries where which we cannot enter for political reasons or other reasons. And um, and what a wonderful time to, what a wonderful opportunity to reach out or to help uh, what we have also seen through, uh, if you remember 2015 was the so-called uh, Islamic Spring, the, the, the movement mm -hmm. or renewed in some countries which then ended in the immigration of many young people coming to the West uh, United States, but also lots of them to Europe and different countries. They came into the countries and were open for the gospel. And some of them were called to ministry, and but they didn't speak the language on, on the ground. And how do we reach them? Now, what we have now is we have Arab speaking students in Poland, in Germany, Netherlands, in the United States, in Australia. Uh, and they can participate in this program wherever they are. What, what a wonderful opportunity this is. And, but that can only happen if we collaborate. You know, if yes. we say it doesn't matter where you are. Another example is, for instance, we have immigrants here in the United States from uh, Myanmar, which is a country in Asia. And they are called to the ministry. And, and we have in Myanmar um, uh, congregations. Um, but for them to study in English is very difficult. Uh, one has to do with the language, the other also with the educational background that many of them have. Uh, and what do you do with a person who is called to the ministry who is maybe 35 or 40 and you know too old to go to one of the traditional universities? And here we are saying, look, why don't we collaborate here and say we have a program in the Myanmar language for Myanmar. We can use that here in the United States. And uh, how can we? So we need to collaborate and work with each other. Right. And, and, and that's an opportunity. What we want to do as an office to build these bridges, to work together, yes. and to, to make these connections. 
Yeah. So along with kind of making those connection points of students from, you know, that may be in America, but need to get their language, you also gather people together. There's an exciting event coming up in April, Global Theology Conference, which is educators and presenters from across uh, across the whole Nazarene world from each region. Tell us a little bit about that. We're excited to, uh, to coll- Holiness Today is excited to collaborate uh, on the podcast with that as well. But tell us a little about from your perspective on how that kind of came to be and and the theme and whatnot for that. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, actually the Global Theology Conference and we'll have the, the fifth Global Theology Conference now. It is uh, it is always called by the Board of General Superintendents. So it is the Board of General Superintendents Conference. However, they ask our office to administer it, to, mm-hmm. to run it, so to speak. So. Uh, and it is uh, uh, the the meeting is April four through six happening in Pilar, which is a city just outside of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and we'll be meeting uh, on the campus of our seminary there. Well, the campus is part of a bigger campus where we also have the Bruno Radi Conference Center and the regional office. So all of these things are together. And so we can gather there. There are facilities to for people to stay and for the meeting and so on. And we'll have we'll gather um, around three hundred people from all of our six regions. Um, and we have presentations, uh, presenters from all of the six regions, people who will respond. Then we have small groups where we interact, and the theme. Uh, for this year is in the power of the spirit based on Luke 4 verse 14 and and we'll do three highlights so to speak or three themes within that and that is holy spirit holy people and hope of creation and uh, I'm really looking forward to that what we have done is uh, people were nominated and vetted who would make presentations, want to make sure we have representatives and presenters from all of the regions. And uh, and then these papers have been written in the language of, of the people, but we translated, they had to submit them a year ahead, and we translated them into the into three major languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and French, four, sorry. And uh, they have been published uh, already in in our um, online magazine called Didache, which is a theological magazine, and uh, everybody can uh, access it, and so that everybody could read them. And then we had people respond to the paper shorts from different things, and then we will meet in small groups. And Klaus, I'll make that I'll make that link to those papers available in the show notes, uh, so people right. can click on that when they listen to this. But you're also going to be recording there those presentations and making that publicly available for people who aren't able to come. That is correct. Yes, we are thankful to work together here with IT uh, and with the uh, information technology people from the South America regional office who will make this available. You're right. Well, I'm going to transition uh, to a couple of fun questions for you. I, I like yeah. I like for our listeners to get to know you on a more personal level. So, out of all the places you've traveled to, you gave me a great memorable story in Africa. But what uh, w- what's another place maybe that you saw that was just so unique or memorable that always sticks in your mind? Yes, um, I must say I've I've been traveling a lot already in my previous role as the uh, rector or president of the European Nazarene College, uh, all over. Europe, I think 30 countries or so, but uh, then going really all over the world now uh, is is uh, very interesting. Well, what I found um, memorable was our trip to Korea, to the Korean Nazarene University, um, for a couple of reasons. One, one reason was that um, usually when, when, when I when we come, uh, you, you know we are tourists. You know, kind of, we don't we don't belong. But <laughs> in, in Korea, and I am five foot ten, but in Korea, I was sticking out. I was a giant, and I thought, okay, that is that is. I never experienced that before. Right. 
And, and I said, okay, this is really different. But what then a wonderful, welcoming uh, country. And that was, that, was, that was just the best. But I realized also when I go to countries and see signs, sometimes I can make sense out of it. Uh, you know, Spanish or French or uh, Portuguese, uh, even with some Russian or, you know, whatever it is. But the Korean language and the signs that they have, there was no connection. I was really yeah. lost. Out of it, out of your element, huh? <laughs> out of, totally out of it. Yeah. That's yeah. great. So you, you, you've done the definitive work on Theodore Jellinghouse. You'll probably correct me on my pronunciation there. Full and present salvation in Christ. Is he yeah. your favorite theologian and, and church's uh, person in history of study? Did you study him so much that you're sick of studying him? I, I've done that before in research. Uh, who's your favorite theologian or, or person right now that you're enjoying reading or studying or, or even book that you would recommend? Yeah. No, thanks. Well, uh, Theodore Jellinghouse. Ah, yeah, see, there we go. There we go. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get it right, but I thought I'd try there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He was an interesting theologian. He was more of a practical theologian in the sense of uh, he was also part of the Lutheran Church and influenced by pietism. And he actually became a missionary to India. He worked in India for four years. And there, uh, with the German Missionary Association that worked in India, and uh, there he got into connection with uh, English uh, missionary associations, and part of them were influenced also by the holiness movement in from England. When he came back to Germany, they invited him to a holiness convention that happened in uh, the United Kingdom in England, and they had speakers from the holiness movement in the United States. Robert Pearsall and Hannah Whitall Smith. Mm -hmm. She wrote the the, the 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 book on the um, uh, the secret of a. I, I know what you're talking. About. Happy life. Correct. Happy life. Secret, secret of a happy life. I couldn't pull it either. I was trying for it. Right. Yeah. Anyways, he was there, and he heard the message of holiness and salvation and and uh, victory over sin for the first time. And he said, oh my, that is a message that we need in Germany. You know, we teach about justification by faith and that's important, but then how do we go on to live a victorious life? And so he said, I want to, I want to share that message in Germany. And he did, he actually started a, a Bible college to prepare people and he said, well, being German, we need a good theological treatise of the matter. So yes. he wrote a book, about 700 pages, <laughs> but it had kind of a, a biblical foundation, historical uh, treatment, but then also a systematic way of understanding sanctification in relation to justification. And the book went through five editions. It was it was well read at the, at the time, circles, and he had quite an influence. Um, but then uh, that movement, and it was was a starting movement uh, from eighteen seventy six to nineteen twelve, but it came to an end through two events. Uh, one was the beginning of the punk movement or pandemic movement that really went into these holiness groups who were open to that and were splitting the groups into uh, into two groups and kind of hard and to it. And the second was then, of course, when World War I came um, and then people said, well, anything that comes outside from Germany must not be good. And so this was kind of killed. Mm -hmm. it, it came to an end. But when I learned about him, I thought, oh my goodness, there were already people, you know, sometimes we think right. that's, yes. that's us. Yeah. And so I, I studied him. So I find him fascinating in trying, and I find it fascinating a couple of things. One is in trying to bring justification and sanctification together on, you know, in the German context. And the other that he said right away, I don't just want to write a book, 
but I want to influence people through education because that's how it happens. And then he started this college there in Berlin and which had quite an influence for 50 years. And so I found that fascinating. Yeah. That's great. So uh, funny question for you. If, if God would have come to you and said, you pick what vocation you want, I'm not going to call you any, anything specific. What did you want to do as a kid? Maybe other than, you know, obviously God, God led you into the role that you're in, but uh, what other vocation do you think you could have been or would have liked to do besides what you're doing now? Well, as a kid, I wanted to become a professional soccer player. I'm, okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, well, that didn't work out. Uh, but uh, at that time, I, I was kind of open. I already had uh, affinities to administration. I like to organize things or, you know, in that direction. That's why my first um, degree actually is in uh, administration. So that, that was already part of my life. Yeah. So do you still play soccer now, pick up soccer here and there? Or? Yes. Well, it's a little bit more difficult with the, with the knees, but yeah. I must say what I liked uh, also when I was the, uh, the director or president of the European Nazarene College, we had an annual soccer game faculty playing the students. And that was fun. The, the downside for us was the students were changing, you know, we got always new students, but we were getting older all the time. So it was getting more and more difficult. But so you fun. had more of a, a strategic gameplay because you had played together for so long, but you're, uh, as you were mm -hmm. aging out, the stamina was, was, was going away. Is that, that, is that is right? right. We <laughs> said we don't run so much. Let's pr play strategically. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's what we did. But there was a time when, when that was not good enough anymore. They just outran. Yeah. <laughs> they, they eventually got too fast. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, so in, in closing, uh, this has been a great time with you, but what is your hope? For your role and your hope for the Church of the Nazarene in the next few years? Yes, uh, I think we are at a at a critical time. Well, uh, not just as Church of the Nazarene, but but I think globally, where I feel um, there's so much energy going into division, or or you know things go differently, or or being uh, how shall I say also being doubtful about other people. And I, I feel there's also a suspicion toward education um, and education institutions. And, and sometimes, you know, there are reasons for that. However, I think we need to, to overcome that. We are only, we only can fulfill the mission in the best way if we work together. We need everybody together. So I, I want to I want to strengthen the relationship of education to the districts and the local churches. We are on one team. The other thing I would like to strengthen is the uh, the partnership globally. You know, we have a wonderful uh, global connection network. We must better use it um, in, in, in a way that will strengthen the work that we do here and how we can also support people in other areas of the world. And I think we will all be uh, winners with that and, and that we strengthen each other and learn from each other. And there are wonderful ways that we can do that. And I see rays of hope, yeah, that that is already happening and can happen and can happen even better. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful about that, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Arnold. This has been a treat, and our listeners are going to uh, love to listen to this and get to know you more. And and we'll and I'll put those uh, resources in the show notes, and I'll we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more from uh, Pilar Argentina on the Theology Conference. We're all excited for that. So, thank well, you thank so much. You. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Holiness Today podcast. If you enjoyed this production and wish to hear more, visit holinesstoday.org slash podcast or find us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.